Hello, it's James here. This time I'm going to show you how I made this robot that fights a human. So this is our base that we've made. We've got wheelchair motors that are gonna fit on the bottom here in the wheel arches. And around the back, there's gonna be a caster wheel that runs on the back there. So we need to paint this up so it's black and doesn't look like wood, and then we can get on with the next section. Right, so here's my wheeled base with my wheelchair motors fitted on there. And obviously we've got the caster on the back. So that makes our two wheel differential drive base. So we can obviously turn by running those motors at different speeds. It's pretty strong. Looks like I can ride on it. So that should be more than strong enough. It's gonna have a big battery on the back. And now we need to make a stick that goes up so that we can put the fighting body on the top. So down here we've got a steel tube, which is some square box section that's bolted on here. We do need to cut these down because we're going to have batteries seated on the bottom. Up at the top we've got a new piece, which is the shoulder section, which is going to allow it to do this. And that's mounted on bearings either side. We just need to put a cap on to stop the bearings falling out. And that's going to pivot sideways, pulled by a motor. If you've been watching my channel for a while, you may remember this one-off pneumatic punching arm that I made using foot pumps instead of pneumatic cylinders because they're pretty cheap which involve taking the one-way valve out and then we made one of these with several actions that could be triggered by solenoid valves. So what we're actually going to do is make another one of those, simplify it a little bit and put one of those on each side. Right, here it is with the arms fitted. So I've bought boxing gloves to put on there so we don't hit people in the face with wood. So obviously the arms can go forward that way and it can also tilt like this, which means it can kind of side swipe. And don't forget they can turn on its base so it can swivel round and punch at the same time. So now we need to put something in that's gonna control this. And to control that, we've got a wiper motor with a sprocket on it. We're gonna have a piece of chain that goes up each side and that's going to tilt the body. Now the only thing about this, just attaching it like that, is as one winds in, the other one doesn't gain the same length that I've wound in, so it will get jammed. So what we're gonna do is actually get that chain and attach some springs or some bungee each side so it can flex. Otherwise we need a massive pulley in the middle 
and drive the chain off it and that will keep everything the same length. So there's my chain and I've got a bit of bungee tied at each end there so there's some flex and that chain can change length. So now we need to get some feedback along this axis here. So what I've done is made a 3D printed pulley that fits around neatly like that and then we'll put a belt around there and fix a pot on the shaft here then we can measure the rotational position. So there's a belt and it goes around a pot that's mounted on a 3D printed block and that of course goes up inside the mechanism there. So as the arms rotate, that will give us position feedback. On the back of the motor of a wheelchair motor, you'll normally find a big solenoid brake and I've removed that and that stops the wheelchair rolling away when the motors aren't running. And of course that gives us a shaft on the motor which the brake would have been on. So that means as the wheel turns, of course that's the back of the motor. So we can use this to measure the motor positions. Right, so I've got my Arduino Mega there fitted on a 3D printed thing. You might recognize this. I've actually repurposed it from when I did the video with Look Mum No Computer. This is the Arduino and the uh, bit of 3D print interface to the fire breathing robot. So check that out. Um, and we've got two rotary encoders here. So uh, these are pretty commonly cheap available quadrature encoders. So the code I've taken straight from Arduino Playground, the rotary encoders um, example three here, which has got some uh, interrupt driven encoder reading code. So I've repeated that twice, once for each encoder. I've also set up PID controllers and I'm running those against that value to output to the uh, motor. So we've got all our PID set up here. And at the bottom, we've got some analog writes that go out to PWM pins that will drive the motors. And we've got some serial data being read here, and it identifies the serial data with an A or a B for each motor. And that means we can set a demand position and the wheel should move until the encoder position is met. And that's what the PID controller is for. So if we open our serial monitor here, we should be able to see that we've got lots of zeros. We've got um, our encoder position. So if we wiggle those, that's the first column and the other one is the third column there. So you can see that update is and I'm turning it and we get quite a, a lot of resolution there for the amount that I'm turning that knob. And the second value is the output of the PID controller. So if I just reset that to uh, zero again and I send some values to it. So if I send 200 and an A, that should set the first one moving until that knob, if I can turn it finally enough, uh, the other way gets, uh, no, I was right the first time gets anywhere near and then you should see that second column coming down as the motor decelerates because it's meeting its demand position. Obviously it will do holding torque as well so if I go past it then it will try and run the motor backwards to um, hold it in position. The second one is the same if I just put in a value there with a B that again updates the second one till I turn that knob and I get near to 500 which is the value I specified and then that acceleration comes down and eventually it should stop the motor. And we'll have to tune that PID controller once these are connected to our wheelchair motors. So as you can see, I've actually geared down the um, encoders here. So this is the encoder and this is the motor. And that's because basically with the amount of encoder counts we get out of each encoder, it was too fast for the Arduino putting them straight on the motors. Um, so now I've geared them down about five to one and the Arduino can cope. It is only an Arduino Mega 2650, but now it works perfectly well. So if I give this some values, we can see those encoders counting up and I've also put a first order filter on so you can see that the uh, deceleration there towards the end and also a cutoff so if there's no more serial data for five seconds it cuts all the motors off and they don't sit there buzzing. So let's just take those back again. There we go, so that's a nice smooth motion. So let's just give that a spin along the floor. So you can see there we get quite a good uh, deceleration there. and that works pretty well. I've also done the same thing for the arm side to side position. So there's a little bit of wobble, but that's pretty good moving side to side. So the arms of course operated by another serial interface where you just send a number and a character for each arm and that makes the arms fire. And the human just gets this shield and a foam bat to fight with. 
All right, I'm at Portsmouth University with final year degree students in computer games technology who've written a virtual reality game. And when you get hit in the game, you get hit in real life by the robot. We're in the VR lab and everything's driven by HTC Vive. So we've got Vive trackers, which track the position of trackers and the headset and the handset. So we've got Vive trackers on the robot arms and one on its base. So the system knows where it is in virtual reality. And we've also got a bat and a shield that have also got Vive trackers on as well as the headset on the human. Okay, so the game is designed so it communicates between Unreal Engine 4 and it sends information to the Arduino here on my right to control, this is what controls the robot. They uh, will then communicate between the ch each other and that's what drives the robot, makes it punch at certain intervals and then the information is sent back, received by the game and turns the robot to make sure the fists are pointing towards me so when I get punched it's not going to miss, it's actually going to try and hit me. The shader works by combining two aspects, cell and Sobel. Cell draws a black outline around the objects, whereas cell affects with the lighting. Sobel works by taking the object, checking where the edges are, and then drawing a black pixel before moving on to the next object. And cell works by taking the directional lighting, applying it to an object, and then checking if it's at 50%. If it's at 50% brightness, it puts a flat light onto it, otherwise it puts a slightly darker overlay onto it. That's what gives the shading effect. So that was a lot of fun. Thanks again to Portsmouth University Faculty of Creative and Cultural Industries for the team there who made that project as their final year degree project in computer games technology. If you like the video, please click on like and don't forget to subscribe for more great content. All right, that's all for now.